Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, Executive Vice President at URL Insurance Group, and thank you for joining us for our Life Insurance 101, The Basics of Life Insurance. We're going to be covering today the history of life insurance, what is life insurance, why life insurance, uses for life insurance, the types of life insurance, term and permanent, living benefits and other riders, underwriting and beneficiary design. Life insurance is really about managing risk and there's different ways to manage risk. There's avoiding it, assuming it, and transferring it. So when we're talking about life insurance, avoiding it, it's impossible. We can't avoid death, it's gonna happen. We can assume risk, which is not to purchase life insurance, and only the very wealthy can afford to assume risk. And then obviously we can transfer risk. Purchasing a life insurance policy will transfer the risk associated with loss income to the insurer. So what is life insurance? A life insurance policy is a contract between the owner of the policy, known as the policy owner, and the insurance company. In some cases, the policy owner and the insured are different from one another. Once a policy is issued, an insurer may not cancel it based on a change in the policyholder's health status. On death of the policyholder, the life insurance provides financial protection for the beneficiary or beneficiaries. Most of the time, the life insurance payment to the beneficiary is tax-free. Life insurance history. So, Going back to 100 BC, Gaius Marius was a general in the Roman army, and he started the first burial club. His troops could buy in, and on death of a club member, the other members would pay for funeral expenses. So today, fast forwarding to 2022, final expense reasons are still one of the top reasons people are purchasing life insurance. June 18, 1583, the first known life insurance policy in England was issued. The insured was a William Gibbons, who was a salter, and the policy owner, Richard Martin, a citizen alderman, and the insurance company was 13 London merchants. The policy was a one-year term policy, and the premium for that policy was 30 pounds, and the death benefit was 400 pounds. Now, the interesting thing is Gibbons died in that year. The merchants, who were the insurance company, contested the claim. Imagine that the life insurance company contesting the claim, that he died after the lunar year, 12 months of 28 days, and they lost this in court with the court siding with the policy owner, Richard Martin, indicating a year is 365 days. In 1693, the first modern mortality table was developed by the astronomer and mathematician Edmund Halley, who is better known uh, for discovering Halley's Comet. And in 1759, the first life insurance company in America was the Corporation for Relief of Poor and Distressed Widows and Children of Presbyterian Ministers. This company was founded by Thomas and Richard Penn, sons of William Penn, the founders of Pennsylvania, or the founder of Pennsylvania. And the Presbyterian Synod of Philadelphia sponsored the first life insurance corporation in America for the benefits of Presbyterian ministers and their dependents. In 1875, the Widows and Orphans Friendly Society was founded in New York, New Jersey by John F. Dryden, who was a Yale student and a Yale dropout. The only product that they sold was, again, burial insurance. And this was the first company in the United States to make insurance available for the working class of all backgrounds and ethnicities. This company today is still in existence and better known by the name Prudential, which is the rock most, of, most everyone has heard of Prudential. So interesting fact, this is our first company here in the United States to really offer life insurance 
to all people of whatever whatever class they were, whatever background and ethnicity they were. The Widows and Orphans Friendly Society, better known today as Prudential, was the first. Here are some fun facts uh, regarding life insurance. Now, all of these pictures have one thing in common, and it is life insurance. So, in 1955, Disneyland was formed, and Walt Disney borrowed against the cash value from his life insurance policy to help finance the creation of Disneyland. In 1961, when Ray Kroc bar bought out his partners, the McDonald brothers, he used cash value from his two life insurance policies to cover salaries of key employees. And in 1980, Pampered Chef founder Doris Christopher used a policy loan of $3,000 out of her life insurance policy to start her company, The Pampered Chef. This company was later purchased by Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway for a staggering $1.5 billion. So a $3,000 loan out of an existing life insurance policy helped create wealth of over $1.5 billion to Doris Christopher. And in 2016, the University of Michigan made Jim Harbaugh one of the highest paid football coaches with a split dollar life insurance policy valued at approximately $75 million and the University of Michigan paying seven annual premiums of approximately $2 million. The top reasons for life insurance ownership today are income replacement, final expenses, wealth transfer needs, paying off a mortgage, business purposes, as well as retirement planning. And of America today, 57% own life insurance, so naturally roughly 43% do not. Of those who own life insurance, 18% own group life insurance only. So that means when they lose their job or leave their job, they are no longer insured with life insurance. 28% own individual coverage only, and 11% of that grouping has both group and individual life insurance. Income replacement or paycheck protection is one of the top reasons for life insurance ownership. So the concept is purchase a life insurance policy in case you die. So your paycheck continues for your family. So if you have a client who earns $60,000 a year or breaking it down monthly, brings home $5,000 a monthly income. If that client wanted to protect that income, for their family for the next 10 years, they should purchase a $543,399 life insurance policy. Now you can certainly help them round up or round down the amount of coverage to what's affordable for them or make a nice round number of 550,000. Uh, if they wanted to cover that for 20 years, the amount they would need is $988,370. So this would allow that family or that, that client of yours, if they were to pass away, they would have a death benefit there to have that income be replaced, that paycheck protection, that the paycheck would still continue for that family so that family could pay their mortgage or their rent, their utilities, their groceries, and that family can stay in a comfortable environment uh, so the kids don't have to get uprooted out of school. They don't have to sell their house and, and move and disrupt an already disrupting time in their life. Driving home the need for income replacement are staggering statistics. So more than a third of U.S. households would feel the financial impact within only one month if the primary wage earner died. Another top reason for life insurance is final expenses. So final expenses can be a number of things. It's not just the funeral or the casket. It's also 
medical bills, the mortgage, paying the mortgage down, credit card or debt, as well as any other debt, loans, um, bills, etc., and leaving a legacy for their family. Now, the average cost of a funeral is approximately $9,000 from Parting.com. Fees for the funeral um, can be the funeral director services at $1,500, casket at $2,300, embalming $500, cost for using the funeral home for the actual funeral service, approximately $500, gravesite $1,000, $600 to dig a grave, cost of a grave liner or outer burial container another $1,000, and the cost of a headstone up to $1,500. That's not including um, a, a wake or again, final medical bills, leaving a legacy, paying off credit, mortgage, et cetera. So a final expense policy, an average final expense policy that we see here at URL is approximately a $10,000 plan. Business life insurance, business succession planning, buy sell agreements are a big, um, a big need with life insurance. So business succession planning or buy-sell agreements, funding partnership agreements, buy-sell agreements with life insurance. Each business owner owns and is beneficiary of a life insurance policy on their business partner. That's called a cross-purchase policy. The, on the death of a business partner, the other partners paid the death benefit. In return, the surviving business partner pays the family of the deceased partner the proceeds of the life insurance benefit for the shares of the company. So this allows two business partners the ability to be in business together. And then when one of the partners passes, the other partner can take control of the business and make the deceased partner's family whole in the value of the business through the life insurance plan. Now, that's when each business owner owns each other's policies. It can also be done on an entity purchase where the business owns the policy and is paid the beneficiary, and then the business pays out the deceased family of, uh, for the life insurance benefit. But business succession planning by sale agreements for business life insurance is one of the uh, number one reasons for a life insurance policy. Another big reason in business is key person insurance. It's where a company owns and is beneficiary of a policy on a key employee. Uh, that key employee, if that key employee dies, the company is paid a death benefit. This helps a company in the event of lost sales, productivity, and provides a company the ability and assets to hire a skilled person to replace the loss of that key employee. Types of life insurance. We're going to start with term life insurance. Term is the simplest form of life insurance. It provides protection for a specific period of time known as the term and is designed for temporary needs like income replacement, debt, mortgage protection, college education. Types of term policies can be level term where you have one year renewable term, 10 year term, 15, 20, 25 year, 30 year, 35 and 40 year level term plans. There's also return to premium term and decreasing term, which isn't very common anymore. A level term policy means that death benefit remains level or the same for the life of the policy, whether that's a one year renewable or a 40 year level term. That death benefit is a million dollars. That day one, that death benefit is a million dollars through the maturity of the policy. A decreasing term, which again isn't very common anymore, the death benefit starts at a million and then gradually decreases over the term policy period of time. Renewable and convertible term. Renewable term is the ability to continue coverage past the initial term period. That initial term period, if the client purchased a half a million dollar 20 year level term in June of 2001. If the term is renewable, the client has the ability to extend their coverage into the 21st year and beyond until the end of the policy. Usually the end of the policy is between, eight, between age 
95 over 99, depending on the insurance company. The downfall to this is the premium will increase after the initial term period and continue to increase every year. So that 20 year level term is gonna have a locked in price for 20 years. That 21st year premium is going to go up and it's gonna go up pretty drastically. And then in the 22nd year, 23rd, 24th, it's gonna to continue to increase. You also have the ability for some term policies to be convertible term. And the ability to convert all or a smaller portion of the term plan to permanent insurance without evidence of insurability. So a convertible term will give that client the ability to convert all or a smaller portion of term to permanent insurance without evidence of insurability. So essentially guarantee issue. So the same client decides to convert all or some of that term to permanent insurance. This is guarantee issue, but the new insurance premiums will be based on the age the client is now. It'll be more expensive than the old term rates, but the client will save money over time in comparing to pay increasing renewable term rates every year. Clients generally exercise a conversion privilege if they have a continued need for life insurance and are no longer insurable or have some significant health issues um, since taking their term policy years ago. Here's an example of a 30 year level term plan. We're looking at a 35 year old female for a quarter million dollars of death benefit. The premium is level for 30 years and is only $267 a year. But if you look at year 31, so for 30 years, death benefits $250,000, Premium is also guaranteed at $267. But in year 31, that premium goes from $267 a year to $4,631. And then in the 32nd year, the premium increases again to $5,071. And an increase again at age 68 in the 33rd year at $5,541. So again, it's a renewable term, but after the 30th year, the prices go up. So in this case, the client may be better off looking at a conversion before the end of the term. Here's an example of a 30 year return of premium term plan. Again, we're looking at the same 35 year old female for $250,000. The premium again is level for 30 years and instead of $267 a year, a return of premium is going to cost a little more. So this return of premium plan is going to be $531 a year. Again, that price is guaranteed for the 30 years, death benefits guaranteed level as well. In the 30th year, you can see that the insured can have a 100% refund of her premiums which at that time would be $15,919.20. But the client also has a, an, an option to have a paid up life insurance policy instead of the return of premium. So the insured could continue their insurance, but at a lower death benefit now, instead of taking the $15,919.20, they can elect to have a paid up life insurance policy of $41,750 and that will last her until age 99 with zero premiums. So after the 30 years, her death benefit, she could choose to reduce to $41,750, have no more premiums and she'll have that coverage until age 99. Or she could take her policy cash value out 100% of it in the 30th year and walk away from her policy. She also has the ability to convert her policy. She would also have the ability to surrender her policy early and get some cash value back or some paid up life insurance, a lesser amount. And as you can see on this slide, there's a guaranteed percentage each year starting in the ninth year. So if she decided in 20 years on a 30 year term to cancel her policy, she would get 61.3% of her money back, which would be 
or if she wanted paid up insurance at that time, not make any more premium payments and have coverage until age 99, that would be $24,750. So the premium's about double of the original 30 year level term, but there's a lot more value and a lot more options available for the client. Now let's transition over to permanent life insurance. There's a couple different permanent life insurance policies that clients have available to them. Let's start with whole life. With whole life, there's non-participating whole life, there's participating whole life, and there's also final expense whole life. We also have universal life, which is known as flexible premium adjustable life policies. And at URL, we have the ability to present the clients a fixed universal life and an indexed universal life policy. Whole life insurance non-participating, a lifelong insurance policy with fixed premium payments and guaranteed cash value. Some policies offer different payment periods. You can have payments for life, a single premium, a one-time premium, and that's it, 10-year premium, 20-year premium payments only, or payments to age 65. So there are some different variations that you, your clients will have the ability to purchase. But with whole life, you know your death benefit is guaranteed never to decrease, and your premiums are guaranteed never to increase. And you also have guaranteed cash value that equals the death benefit at policy maturity. So guaranteed premiums, guaranteed death benefit, guaranteed cash growth three guarantees on a whole life policy. And that cash value, as it says, will equal the death benefit of policy maturity. So in an example, if you have a $100,000 death benefit, that cash value will equal $100,000 at policy maturity, which is generally age 120. Here's a snapshot of our same 35 year old female with a whole life, non-participating whole life paid to age 100. You can see on a permanent life policy in this whole life policy, premiums have increased quite a bit over a 30 year level term, a 30 year return to premium term. Now the premiums are 2023 a year, about four times of what the return of premium term price was. So at 2023, this 35 year old female has a guaranteed death benefit of $250,000 to age 120, a guaranteed premium that will never go up and guaranteed cash value. So if we look out at age 65 in 30 years, the client has paid in $60,675 into the policy. Cash value is guaranteed at 79,088. So there's 19,000, almost 19,000 guaranteed more cash value than they paid into the policy in 30 years. Death benefits $250,000. And if she at this time decided to not pay any more premiums, the paid up life policy at that time would be 183,250. Whole life insurance. Now that we're going to look at participating whole life insurance, a policy owners uh, in a participating policy, they participate in the insurance company's profits in the form of a dividend payment. Dividends will grow cash value and the death benefit. Now, a dividend payment is determined by multiple factors, current interest rate environment, company's revenue and expenses, mortality rate of policyholders company's profits retained in cash reserves, beginning and ending cash value of the policy. So as you can hear with dividends, there's some factors that come involved. So the dividend is not guaranteed, but it is highly likely that there will be a dividend payment. One of our top whole life carriers, it's a participating whole life carriers is Mass Mutual. And as an example, Mass Mutual is pay dividends every year for over 150 years. So that includes events in our country like the Civil War, 
the Great Depression, World War One, World War Two, the Great Recession, all of that, through all of those ups and downs of our country, they have always paid a dividend. So while dividends are not guaranteed, they are highly likely with insurance companies on a participating whole life policy that they will pay. So how are dividends paid? Uh, one of the most common is paid up additions, uh, which essentially is you're putting the dividend back into your policy. That helps grow the death benefit greater and the cash value. It's very popular. There's dividend on deposit with interest. Any interest earned will be taxable. This is paid to the policy owner on surrender of the policy or paid to the beneficiary on death. Uh, dividends can also be used to reduce the premium payment each year. Uh, and lastly, you know, dividends can also be paid in cash. And that is a not a taxable event. Here's a snapshot of what a participating whole life looks like. Again, paying to age 100 on the same 35 year old uh, female. So this is roughly $600 more premium than a non-participating whole life for this client. But as you can see, it also has a guaranteed cash value uh, every year, a guaranteed death benefit every year. But the non-guaranteed values are based on the dividend growth. And this is using the participating policy and using the paid up additions, putting the dividends back into the policy. So you can see the death benefit at age 55, assuming the current dividend um, would be $292,117. That's adding paid up additions, putting that back in. At age 65, would, the death benefit would grow to $350,810. Fast forward to age 85, $553,395. Um, and the non-guaranteed cash value based on the dividend at age 65 is $136,034 and 88,788 dollars is guaranteed. You know, compared to 79,088 on the non-participating policy. So you pay a little more in, you have a little bit more benefit on a participating policy. Final expense whole life, these are non-participating policies. Um, again, it's a whole life policy, so a lifelong insurance policy, fixed premium payments, guaranteed cash value. Death benefits can range on final expense policies anywhere from $1,000 to $50,000. So these are smaller death benefits. Generally speaking, the average death benefit issued is $10,000. Um, usually offered to clients ages 50 and above and most of the times even age 60 and above. It is an easy, simplified underwriting process as well as guaranteed issue policies. So here's a snapshot of a 65 year old female for $10,000 of final expense coverage. You can see the premiums are starting at about $37 and change monthly up to $46 a month and a lot of this will be determined on health of the client. Um, it is a simplified application process, limited health questions, but some companies are better with heart issues or cancer or stroke than others. And uh, that's something that we look at each in individual client to try to put them into the best company based on their, their health or uh, that they have. Moving on to universal life and indexed universal life. Uh, universal lives are permanent insurance policies like whole life being a permanent plan, but they do differ from whole life being that they have a flexible premium and adjustable life where whole life is more static, where you have a guaranteed premium and a guaranteed death benefit. You don't have adjustments or flexibility in a traditional whole life policy like you do with the universal life plans. Now, universal life will have a minimum guarantee period depending on the company and product. That could be 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and sometimes that's even to age 90, 95, age 100, and age 120. You have a fixed universal life plan where the company determines and sets the interest rate the client receives, and you have indexed 
where the client experience market gains with downside protection, and generally the indexes are linked to the S&P 500. On the left, you'll see a visual snapshot of kind of a, how universal life very basically works. Imagine a barrel filling up with water. Uh, the, the hose um, is the premium payments that you're paying in that fill up that barrel. And you're also getting sprinkles of interest going into that. So the, the water accumulating in the barrel is your cash. And imagine interest helping gain that. Uh, whether that's a fixed interest rate or an index interest rate. And at the bottom of the barrel, there's a spigot with bringing the water or the cash value out of the policy, and that's the insurance cost associated with the life insurance plan. Now, on an index universal life plan, we like to say zero is your hero. Now, this is a policy that has a cap of 9.5% on the interest gains and a floor of 0% with a 100% participation rate. So on an index universal life, you will experience or your clients will experience the gains of the market, but not the losses. So, but the gains will be up to a, a cap or a ceiling. In this case, with this product, it's 9.5%. The floor is 0%. So that's why we say zero is your hero on those down years. So here's a snapshot from 2003 through 2021. 2003, 8, 9, 12, 16, 19, we had down years on the S&P 500. So in 2003, a client, if they had their money in the market or the S&P, they would have lost 19.89% in that given year. With an index UL, there'd be a zero loss that year. So zero is our hero in 2003. 2004, there's a good bounce back here. S&P gained 23.29%. Now on the index UL, we have a ceiling. You're experiencing gains of the market up to 9.5% on this plan. Fast forward to 2000, the 2008 to 2009 period, Again, the S&P lost big, 38.5% during that great recession. In that index UL, you've lost nothing there. Um, and then again, in the bounce back year, where it gained up to 34.64%, you have a 9.5% ceiling or cap. So this takes out all the big peaks and valleys of a, a long historical period of the S&P or of having money in the market. So it's going to gain fairly similar to over time, but again, timing's everything. So if you're getting near retirement and you have a year like 2002 to 2003 or 2008 to 2009, those are hard years to bounce back from when you're nearing retirement. So this again takes away a lot of those peaks and valleys.
common life insurance riders, uh, riders would also be add-on, what would be known as like an add-on to the life insurance policy. Common rider is a child term rider. This covers all children up to age 25 for one flat fee. And that's approximately five or six dollars a month on a life policy for ten thousand dollars of coverage. Children will then have the ability to convert the term rider to permanent insurance up to five times the original amount, usually capping out at fifty thousand dollars. So again, this provides a family or a parent with the ability to add their kids for a low flat fee onto their policy. So it's not five dollars a month per child, it's a five dollar flat fee doesn't matter if that family has one child or 10 children. It would be one, one $5 monthly cost. Accidental death is another common rider on a policy, and that generally will double the death benefit if a client dies due to an accident. And waiver of premium for disability. If the client becomes totally disabled prior to age 60, the company will waive future premiums. Accelerated living benefits are very popular with life insurance plans now. There's a terminal illness accelerated living benefit, which is the ability to accelerate usually up to 50 to 75% of the policy value if the client has a life expectancy of 12 months or less. There are long-term care and or chronic illness riders, which provide a monthly acceleration of the death benefit if the client cannot perform two of six forms of daily activities or severe cognitive impairment. This helps supplement the rising cost of home health care and nursing care. Critical illness rider pays out for heart attack, stroke, life-threatening cancers, ALS, blindness, paralysis, severe burns, loss of limbs, major organ transplant, coronary artery bypass, graft surgery, and other critical illnesses. So uh, some carriers provide more additional uh, critical illness payouts if they have some other pieces and some limit that but basically the critical illness benefit if a client has a heart attack stroke life-threatening cancer they'll have the ability to get a payout of their life insurance benefit early to help with those medical costs and there are fraternal life insurance companies that can offer some unique benefits uh, some of these companies offer college scholarship benefits for the children and grandchildren of members, orphan child benefits, orphan child college scholarships, diabetic benefits, prescription drug benefits, and more. Underwriting life insurance. So underwriting life insurance can be in a number of different ways. Traditional, simplified, non-medical, automated, accelerated underwriting. There's a lot of different ways. So traditional medical underwriting requires a paramed exam by a nurse at the client's home or a, a facility where they would get their height, weight, blood pressure, pulse, blood, urine, sample, all, all, uh, all done. Sometimes an EKG if it's a big enough amount. Uh, and generally those nurses will come to the client's home. It's free of charge for the client. There's no charge for doing this. Uh, sometimes medical records are requested from the doctor uh, there's a medical information bureau check, prescription drug check. If healthy, the client can qualify for preferred rates and have a lower potential premium and approximately about 30 days of underwriting. Now there's also non-medical underwriting where no paramed exam is needed, but companies will still access medical records if they need them. Um, it's still a traditional underwriting turnaround time. Uh, but can be potentially quicker because there's no need for the paramed examination. They're still doing the same medical information bureau check, the MIB check, prescription drug checks. Um, good premiums, but usually not better than a traditional medical underwriting through a non-medical underwriting process and a similar underwriting turnaround time. Simplified non-medical underwriting. Uh, like non-medical underwriting, there's no paramed exam. But now they're not going to also, they're not going to get medical records if needed. So they there's no APS doctor records. This is generally going to be a little higher cost for healthy clients, but the products take more risk into them. They're still going to look at MIB checks, prescription drug checks, but they'll cap a death benefit usually for about 250 to 400 thousand um, dollars. These policies can be underwritten in minutes or just a couple days. 
Then lastly, you have automated accelerated underwriting, where there's no paramed exams, no APSs, policies are issued in minutes. There's MIB check, prescription drug check, and there's also big data checks, credit reports, et cetera, done. Um, you can do larger face amounts, best premiums for healthy clients. You can do the super preferred through standard, standard rates here. And it's a very quick turnaround for those who can qualify. We're gonna use an example from The Simpsons with Homer Simpson and his neighbor Ned Flanders here. So using these different underwriting processes. Let's look at Homer. Let's, let's assume he's a 40 year old male who's a social cigar smoker, 510, five, five feet, 10 inches tall, 270 pounds. He's got some blood pressure, cholesterol medications. He's borderline diabetic with sleep apnea. Now on the other side of the fence, you have Ned. Now Ned's also 40. He's a non-smoker. He's also five feet 10, but he's 180 pounds. He's healthy and not on any medications. If Homer and Ned want a 20 year, $250,000 term plan, through traditional medical underwriting for Ned, he's gonna qualify for a rate of about $20.93, a preferred, super preferred type rate. Homer, on the other hand, is gonna get a rate of about $44.07 monthly, maybe even a little higher uh, once they get his medical records, review everything. Um, and that's because he's gonna qualify at a standard rate possibly a mild substandard table two rate class. If we go through automated underwriting for these two, uh, where it's gonna be done very quickly, rapidly, Ned's gonna get a premium of about $29.96. Um, no paramed exam issued within a matter of minutes or a couple days, uh, where Homer, on the other hand, is gonna receive a premium of $67.46 again, because of his build, his height and weight, because of these health conditions, but it's a little bit more convenient for him. So uh, again, Ned and Homer may look at that and say, hey, for Ned, an extra $9 a month, so I don't have a paramed exam, uh, that may be a better way to go. Same with Homer. I might be able to afford an extra 23 a month um, and be good with an automated process. And then for a simplified non-medical, both Ned and Homer would have the same rate because they're the same age, doesn't matter about their health status, they're gonna be $67.16 each. So the simplified non-medical process would probably benefit Homer way more than Ned because Ned can, again, if he went through the hoops, he can get a premium for as little as $21 a month. So that gives you a little bit of an example of traditional medical underwriting, automated and simplified non-medical how that would work in the real world. Beneficiary design for children. If the benefit is for a minor child, UTMA, the Uniform Transfer to Minors Act is generally used. Parents name a custodian to control and manage the assets for the minor child until the minor reaches age 21. At that time, the assets are turned over to the child. The advantage is there's no out-of-pocket cost to do this. The disadvantage is there's no real control of how the assets are distributed. Now, the, another way to do this for minor children is to establish a trust and name a trust beneficiary. The advantage, more detailed and provides increased control on how and when the assets are distributed. The disadvantage is there's extra cost and time in establishing a trust. Now with beneficiary design, there's what we call the Goodman Triangle or the unholy trinity. It occurs when there are three different parties on a life insurance certificate or policy. The owner, the insured, and the beneficiary. This situation can potentially expose the owner to taxation of the death benefit proceeds upon the death of the insured. So on a traditional life policy for husband and wife, um, the husband is the insured and the owner of the policy, and he names his wife the beneficiary. On the wife's policy, she owns the policy on herself and names her husband or kids or as beneficiaries, and that generally will flow through tax-free. 
where we have, when we have three parties on one policy, that's where it gets sticky. So if you, the two common situations where we see this happening is where we have the owner being spouse one, the insured spouse two. So let's say the owner is the husband and the insured is the wife. They name their children the beneficiary. Well, upon the death of spouse two, which is the wife, a taxable gift of death benefit proceeds is made by the husband to their children. It is looked at that the husband is gifting their children that amount of insurance. Now, if spouse two, the wife, was also owner of the policy, if she was the insured and owner, and the kids were the beneficiary, so that's only two parties in the policy, tax-free distribution to the kids. So that is a common mistake people make in beneficiary design. The other common mistake is child one owns a policy on their adult parent and parents' kids are the beneficiary. We see this where we have one child who's kind of managing maybe mom or dad's um, uh, you know, funeral and other things. So child one owns the policy on, on mom or dad and makes let's say his brother and sisters, the beneficiary. Upon death of the parent, a taxable gift of a portion of the benefit of proceeds is made by child one to each of their siblings. So again, this is where if child one is gonna own the policy on mom or dad, that child should also be the beneficiary and then take care of those funeral expenses and other expenses. Two other common situations seen on business cases where the owner of a policy is a business um, and then the insured is the business owner and then the owner spouse of the business is made beneficiary. Again, here we're seeing that the death benefit is, becomes a taxable compensation or dividend to the owner spouse. If the individual made themselves the beneficiary, then it would be tax-free and pass, and then they could pass that along to the owner's spouse. Business is the owner and the key employee is the insured and the spouse of the key employee would be the beneficiary. Again, upon death of the key employee, the death benefit proceeds made will be taxable as compensation to the spouse of the key employee. Best thing to do is if you have any questions on beneficiary design on existing policies or how to design new policies is to contact us to verify how that should be set up. But look for the Goodman Triangle, otherwise known as the unholy trinity, where you have three parties on one policy. You may be running into a taxable situation. And that is it for today. If you have any questions, please reach out and we'll be happy to assist. And thanks for joining us for our Life Insurance 101 presentation. Thank you.